Thank you very much for checking out episode number 63 of the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz, the final episode for 2020. Of course, this has been a different year for everybody for a variety of reasons, but I'm glad to be doing the podcast still for you all. The next episode, episode number 64, is going to be my first weekly episode. The plan is to change the format up for a little bit and do 30 minute or less episodes weekly, not bi-weekly. So looking forward to producing more content for you all ASAP. Well, all that said, this episode features recent interviews that I taped with three different performers who all have a lot going on. Ashba, aka DJ Ashba, Kristen Chenoweth, and Fran Healy from the band Travis. First up is the interview with DJ Ashba. DJ Ashba is one of those people that 10 people would know for 10 different reasons. A lot of people would know him for his work in Guns N' Roses. He played guitar in that band for a long time. A lot of people would know him for his work in the band 6AM with Nikki Six or Motley Crue. Of course, he's done solo stuff. Years ago, he was in the band Beautiful Creatures, who were on a major label. But his latest single is A Christmas Storm. We spoke about that. We also spoke about his life as an entrepreneur. Not everybody realizes that he's got a company called Ashba Media, which produces set pieces for major touring productions. Not just Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue kind of stuff, but big, big shows that you're definitely familiar with. Really nice guy who also happens to be named Darren. Second, you're going to hear my interview with Kristen Chenoweth. This was a unique one. I was one of many interviews that she did in a couple of hours over the course of a day, basically to promote Kellogg's and also her new movie, Holidays, which is on Netflix, holiday-themed movie. That was pretty funny. My wife is a big fan of it. But I like to change things up in these celebrity junket kind of things. I like to ask things when possible that, not for the sake of throwing off the people per se, but changing it up. So knowing that Kristen's from Oklahoma and that she's a wonderful singer with real credits, I decided to ask her some things about Oklahoma musicians. So Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains came up in conversation. So did Leon Russell. Great conversation that I had with her. It's a short one. Last but not least is my interview with Fran Healy from the band Travis, one of my favorite bands for a long, long time now. As I kind of stammer out at the beginning of the interview, I've been a fan of Travis for now over 20 years. That's kind of the realization that you're getting older, (laughs) to say the least, and also that your favorite bands are becoming classic rock bands when they've been around for that long. But the new album from Travis is called 10 Songs, not a clever album title where there's 11 songs. There's actually 10 songs. One of them is a duet between Fran and Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles. Another great album from Travis. I'm still a big fan, and this is my first time talking to Fran, you know, voice to voice. I had done email Q&A with him a couple of years ago. Not a very personal experience. Hard to gauge a person's personality from that, but I came away from this one hearing a modest, fun, funny, interesting guy. He actually picks up the guitar during the interview to show me something when I asked about a particular Travis song. Really do hope to speak with him again. I'm sure I could have spoken with him another two hours, much to his <laughs> not so delight. But thank you so much for listening to the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrow. It's in 2020, 2019, 2018. It's just, it's great. The time is flying by and couldn't do it without your support. Thanks. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. Stay well and stay healthy and great Shabbos. Paltrowcast. 
Ms. Pac-Man. Ms. Pac-Man is right there. Uh, I don't picture you as a big gamer, but do I have that I, wrong? I, I'm, I'm not too big of a gamer. I want to get more into it, but I, uh, yeah, I'm too busy to game. You've I, only got, a, you know, four talents and hobbies, you know. I, I admire the people that sit around and play video games all day. I was like, God, I, would, I just never was dealt those cards, I guess. I'm always working. So, Save it for retirement. Uh, I did but, things the opposite way. Like I, I, you know, I made it music, and then I created a day job for myself, which was fucking stupid. You know, <laughs> and and that is actually something I want to ask you about a little later after you get the housekeeping out of the way, because less than uh, twelve months ago, you were promoting Christmas in Hell. Uh, this is a more optimistic <laughs> side of of the Christmas spectrum. When did you decide that you were going to do a new Christmas project of your own? Um, well, it's it's not a Christmas project. It's just I. Uh, I just released a Christmas single is all called the Christmas storm. And I have a brand new project, a solo project on uh, universal. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited about it. My goal was to kind of fuse the world of, you know, big rock guitars into the EDM platform. And, um, and I've had a lot of fun as a songwriter producer yeah. uh, on paper. It sounds easy. And when you get in there and really, understand that uh wow i i kind of get why there's not a lot of guitar in edm because it sits in the same frequency as the synths you know so um you know really trying to figure out a creative unique way how to reapproach the guitar to make it sound more like a synth or you know with kill switching or whatever and um and just blending the two instruments in a in a just a strategic way to make it uh all sit properly in the track, you know, but yeah, so I just released a, a Christmas song called a Christmas storm and we tied it to toys for tots national and mm -hmm. yeah, that's where we're at. Well, I'm calling it a project. You say it's a single. I'm saying it's a project because <laughs> to get a bunch of songs into that medley style, a yeah. comprehensive music video that has choreography costumes, I, I assume is filmed where you are right now. No, actually, we filmed it at Mojave Studios. I, I probably should have and could have uh, done it at my rehearsal room because it's plenty big enough. But, uh, um, you know, they just had a, a beautiful setting down there. I walked in and uh, the room seemed like it fit the spirit of the song. So we ended up renting out that place. And, and it was great. We got, uh, you know a whole quartet in there that uh, the quartet that Aerosmith uses and um, six ballerinas and my head dancer Skylar uh, choreographed the whole, all the dancers and stuff. It was, it was a lot of fun. My wife was in the video and uh, everybody said she's, she's the angel of the video that grants the little girl the wish. And uh, she'll fight you on that. She'll say she's a mystical creature in the video. So it's pretty funny semantics uh, when you say the string quartet that Aerosmith uses do you mean like the the people that David Campbell uh uses for his orchestrations you know I I don't know I just know they played with Aerosmith quite a bit and I cool. think it's probably uh you know maybe on the residency I'm not sure where they play with I just know that was one of their big that's credits. a great credit to have Aerosmith yeah. simply put but and they're so, like they're they're amazing the, the quartet is amazing you know, they were they were there between, you know, when they'd shut the take off, they were actually really playing the song. So it was pretty neat. Cool. Well, credit goes to you. I first learned about you from Beautiful Creatures. So we're talking about 20-ish years ago. And of like course, that. you had credits before that. And of course, you've had many, many credits after that. But right. I'm curious when it stopped being a struggle in terms of work and when you reached this point in your career where the work was coming to you instead of you having to pound the pavement so much. Um, you know, I honestly, I pound the pavement still to this day. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it ever got to a point to where it's just, you know, I mean, yeah, a lot of stuff landed in my lap probably, but I definitely worked my ass off to get, get to that point. You know, it's like, it's kind of like, you know, people always said, you know, you know, it's easy to sit back and if you don't know the whole story and go, oh, he got lucky, he got guns and roses and stuff like that. But 
the thing is, is if you didn't do your homework up until that moment, right. when that moment comes and you're not prepared, that ship's going to keep selling. So um, I just don't believe in that. I believe in, you know, if anybody knew the hard work that it takes and a lot of people do, you know, um, but the ones that, you know, certain people sit back and go, oh, they're just lucky in life. To, you know, I, I, there's a little bit of luck involved, but there's a hell of a lot of uh, dedication and hard work that goes into, into it else, you know. You just yeah. Don't well, the opportunities, you know. So. You're, you're not the first former member of Guns N' Roses I spoke with, so I'm aware of yeah. the inner workings without saying anything too much there. But what I'm getting at is, like, was it 2005 or 2006 yeah. that things got a little easier for you? Yeah, you know, I, I remember uh, when we were first starting the 6 a.m. album, and me and Six would, uh, we were always constantly together. So we'd be in, I remember I was sitting in his car one day, and I go, how do you know? And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, how do you know when you just, you go to bed one night, not famous and you wake up famous like how where is that you know how do you know and i remember he 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 told me he goes you'll just know and and i remember getting off of a jet in some foreign country i can't even remember where where i was but with guns and roses and i remember coming out and there was police everywhere people with guns and they had like two to three thousand people at the airport waiting for us barricades we get in the van and it's rocking but going through the airport i see my face all over tvs and stuff and i remember talking to six that night at the hotel i go i think i know now you know it's just one of those weird moments where it just kind of you know life just switches you know and and i'm very thankful and grateful that i i was able to reach that point you know and uh yeah it's, it's a trip. Was the long-term plan always to be a songwriter and producer and collaborator for other artists? Or is that just something that happened haphazardly? Uh, long-time plan was uh, probably to rob liquor stores. And, <laughs> uh, no, man. I've, I've always... Uh, I, I was never good at learning other people's music. You know, I'll be the first to admit it. Like, I'm not that guitar player like you know, the, the Guns N' Roses gig fit more like a glove than probably any other style of music just because I was such a fan of the music growing up. And so Slash's style, you know, that very bluesy, pentatonic style, you know, really fit me, you know, and I, I felt like I could bring something to the table and do whatever I could to at least do that that justice, you know, but... Uh, but yeah, you know, learning other people's songs, I've never actually had a, a big desire to do it. I've always just, since I was young, just always tried to write my own stuff. That's, it's just always kind of been in my blood. And I would study every kind of music, like all kinds of, uh, you know, different genres. I never just listened to rock, you know. But I, I was in a jazz band, to a pep band, to, you know, I just loved music. And I, and I never was intrigued solely by guitar ever you know i was always intrigued by orchestra music and you know i was always listening to john williams and danny elfman and you know uh just i love composers you know and i i just love christmas music and that whole theatrical feel behind you know when you go to disneyland that that feel that it, that music gives you you know it just i i could it could be june and i could put in a christmas song and i it just makes me feel good, you know, and there's something cool about Christmas and Christmas songs that have always kind of touched me. Maybe it reminds me of my childhood. I don't know, but it's, uh, I was really happy to kind of tap into, uh, you know, a, a single to be able to put out a single. And it was actually Tony from the label's idea. Um, and it was a last minute thing that I had to throw together. I had like a month to get the song, you know, record the song figure it out and uh shoot a video and mix it master it, and mm -hmm. it a lot of work I, a lot of work would be an understatement because again it's not a single it's a damn project it, it <laughs> was it, it, it was definitely a project to get that song done for sure the way i envisioned it and 
you know, um, Caster Troy did the video and the video couldn't have turned out. It, it honestly, I, you know, I was on set and I was like, I, I see it this way. And I set up the Christmas tree and I was like, set the little girl there. I, I saw it as plain as day in my head and he just nailed really, uh, what was in my head. And, and I love working with him because of that. And, you know, I have a great team of people around me though. I have, you know, JP on the track, uh, helps me in the studio. And then I got, uh, my assistant engineer, Robert, uh, Gusman and Luca, who's just a world famous mixer and master, uh, guy. So I got a really small tight knit, uh, family around me, but, uh, very fortunate to have good people. Awesome assistant, Paige. <laughs> There's Paige. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned before, though, that you have great memories associated with Christmas. Was it the kind of thing where you got your first guitar as a Christmas present? I got my first BB gun at Christmas. and shot out the gas station window and almost got arrested, but I was too young, so I got off. But I, I uh, you know... I don't know what it is, honestly. I, I have vague memories of, of when, you know, some of the good times growing up and the family all together and, you know, just the Christmas cookies. And if I, if I, you know, like growing up now, I wish I would have held on to that a little more, you know, because you just don't realize, you just feel like those days are going to be, you know, but people pass away, you, you know, things right. happen. You realize you know, as you get older, that, man, I wish I really would have, you know, held on to that and taken it in a little more, you know, probably, but, uh, yeah. Well, on a, on a brighter note, because I'm going to just keep throwing compliments uh, your way, I look at where you are in your career, which is that this is a successful guy that steadily works in a mix of projects, whether or not we know that it's you behind them. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of work you do that it's not on your Wikipedia page. You know, that's a pretty incomplete Wikipedia, but is yeah, there whoever, whoever did my Wikipedia it, like needs to be fired because there, <laughs> I read it and I'm like, there are so much misinformation, like so many things on there that so yeah, I don't know who, who goes by Wikipedia, but you know, it's, it's, you have to do your like four tiered research thing and you go, okay, what is the publicist saying? What's <laughs> Wikipedia saying? Uh, what are the other interviews that the person does where they dispel the Wikipedia and the IMDB page say? Yeah. And then what do you actually get from listening to the new project? What input is there? So all that said, is there anything that you haven't yet accomplished or worked on or still want to do? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things, you know, that I, I would love, I would love to get more into acting and do some more TV stuff. But, uh, you know, my thing right now, my only focus is bringing this new music that I've created to the to the fans, you know, get this show, you know, we're working up a really spectacular show for people. And, and, uh, you know, I hope the EDM world, uh, you know, is is uh accepting of it because it, it is a different sound you know it's a very unique uh it has a very unique sound to it which is exciting and a little scary too you know to go out there in front of a completely different crowd but i haven't been this inspired in a long time so um yeah i'm excited about it does that mean that jump by van halen getting its number one edm release <laughs> is, is in any way connected to this I just think that's great. I just, I love, I've always hated walls around genres. I hate, I mean, I get why we have to kind of categorize stuff, but yeah, you don't find anything in a record store, but you know, I hate that it really does limit the, the writers and the producers of, of these songs. You know, it's like, I hate the rules. And this is the first time in my career that I'm not writing for radio. I could give two shits about radio um, I, it's the first time I'm actually, I feel like there's no rules. There's no walls, mm -hmm. no format. I don't feel like I have to hit the court, you know, and it, it's just, to me, it's just, this is the most art artsy I've been able to be and free. I've been able to be with, uh, writing songs and producing songs. And to me, you know, I've worked, I've worked for this, you know, <laughs> I go, you know, I, I really don't care if, if people get it. That's great. But if they don't, 
this project is more just so, you know, it's just something I've always wanted to do. Something different than, you know, I have 6 a.m., you know, we're, right. um, you know, so it's like, you know, uh, if they want to hear me play rock, rock, you know, I, I have my rock band, but this is something different. This is, I'm trying to kind of break, break some rules and break down some barriers and uh, kind of merge uh, a few different genres together and see what happens, you know. Do you yourself dance? I ask that not like to be a jackass with that question, but you'll find that some EDM oriented people hate dancing. <laughs> I suck at dancing. Uh, <laughs> if I have a guitar and a bottle of Jaeger, I can dance. Okay. But um, no, my wife actually, she's a great dancer. She's Colombian. She, she just has it, but uh, she actually hired a dance instructor to the house one day. And I had three lessons and I made it through like a half of one. And I said, don't ever bring that motherfucker back here ever again, because it's just, and yeah, it's horrible. I, you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. You got time for, uh, you got time for three more questions and then you're a free man. I'm good. Okay. The first question is a stupid thing, but I've never heard this addressed before. Um, you weren't the only Darren in Guns N' Roses at one given point of time. Is that something that was ever discussed amongst Guns N' Roses? That was, at, for a while, the most popular name in Guns N' Roses? Um, that was never discussed. That was never discussed. Um, and in fact, most people don't even know my real name. So it's like one of those things where when, when I was a young kid, my mom remarried, and she remarried a guy with a, a kid already named Darren. So I immediately was called BJ, you know? Um, so uh, my whole life since I was really little, nobody's ever called me Darren. So when they do, I don't even, it's like, I don't even respond. It's weird. Uh, but yeah, no, nobody's ever, nobody's ever brought it up really. <laughs> did you have a whole childhood of bewitched references to Brave? I did a little bit, yeah. And, and which was weird to me because I didn't watch Bewitch and I yeah. didn't watch TV. You know, because I grew up in a religious family and we weren't allowed TVs in the house. So I, all I had was a piano and a guitar growing up. So, yeah. You made it out of Indiana. And that's yeah. another thing about Guns N' Roses. Half the band's from Indiana. Is that by design? Is that part of how you got the gig? No, actually, no. Uh, yeah, me, Izzy, and, and Axel are all from Indiana. And it's like, uh, but no, not at all. I, I never knew them back home. Um, Sharon Osborne originally introduced me, walked me over into the studio and, uh, beautiful creatures was in one studio and guns was doing Chinese democracy in another studio. Wow. And, uh, Sharon Osborne was his best friends with Gloria Butler, who's geezers Butler's wife. And she was our manager. So we were always with Sharon, like always because of our managers. And that's how we did Ozfest and, all that stuff. But I remember I was playing D, uh, Randy Rhodes piece, uh, just in the studio between takes, wait for them to change the two inch tape, whatever. And I looked up and in the doorway, Sharon was in tears and I had no idea she was even standing there. Um, and anyway, we got to talk and then she walked me around the corner and took me in to introduce me to Axel. But that was the first time I'd ever met him. And that was many, many years before I ever got the gig. But, uh, you know, I guess from what he says, I've been on his radar for a long time. I, I was pretty uh, flattered that he even followed my career. You know, I mean, I was shocked that he even knew who I was. But, uh, um, but that was pretty cool, you know. I, I had no idea about any of that history, and I'm really flattered that you shared that with me. That's, that's great, and it's great to know that you can – can actually play the Randy Rhodes tracks because how many people can play anything besides the finger tapping part of Crazy Train? Right, right, exactly. And I, I grew up again on, on Eddie Van Halen and Randy Rhodes. Like you can go back to every interview and Scotty Moore, I loved Elvis because mm -hmm. my mom, that was one little bit of rock and roll I was allowed to listen to. All the others I had to sneak, you know, my older brother gave me his big box of Kiss posters and I literally had to hide them behind the furnace so my mom and 
my dad didn't know about it. And then they found him and I got whipped by a belt and they threw him out. And uh, it was kind of neat because when I had left home many years later, my first real tour with Beautiful Creatures was opening up for Kiss. And right. I got call back home and go, remember those posters you threw out? Yeah, I'm, I'm on tour with those guys. So it, it felt kind of good. So. <laughs> wow. So Everything just, comes full circle. Um, aside from all the music and all that, do you have a TV recommendation that you could pass on to people who are looking for a new show? God, again, I, uh, it's a good show. I'm, I'm trying to think what I... Age knows? I mean, I, honestly, I watch a lot of IV Go. <laughs> uh, I, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really a big TV watcher. Again, I grew up without a TV, so I don't... Um, I just kind of put in a movie here and there when I get some free time. But I, I'm not that guy that gets sucked into TV shows too much because... There's three things, not two things, I think are a waste of time. It's sleeping and eating. I hate. I hate going to bed, and I hate eating because I just feel like it's a big waste of time. I am such a workaholic. All I do is work. And, um, you know, so for me to – I'll always have TV on in the background, but I'm never watching. I'm always on the computer designing clothing or, you know, writing a new song or whatever I'm doing. I'm always busy. Or I love to fix shit around the house. So I'm – I'm like Bob Vila. <laughs> so you're a doer. That's the vibe that I get. You don't like to watch other people do stuff. Never. Like, it, you know, any of my friends that come over, the one thing they're always like, if you didn't know you were in all these big bands, you would never know you're a musician because, you know, outside of my guitar, you know, like hundreds of guitars throughout my house. But I never really talk about music or any of that stuff because I never talk about or focus on the past things I've done, which my sister is always like, you got to stop. And, you know, cause I get really down on myself if I don't achieve certain things and I set high goals and wow. Uh, and I'm always pushing myself as hard as I can. But, uh, you know, I don't know. It's one of those things where I just, every day I just want to get that much closer to my next goal before I, hit the hit the bed at night so and, and are all these goals written down somewhere on some vision board no no it's just just something you know i i i live eat and breathe you know i i'm always working about two two to three years ahead um so i'm constantly designing clothing that it's not going to come out till and and writing stuff and working on concerts that won't you know people won't be able to enjoy for another probably who knows how long, but, uh, you know, I just love to work. You know, I love to, you know, again, I'm, I'm nothing more. I think, I think if I have to sit too long, then, then the demons in my head, I got to listen to them. So I think I'm constantly just keep busy in that way. You know? <laughs> I, I get where you're coming from, man. Well, in closing DJ, any last words for the kids? Just, just thank you, man. T tune in uh, to my Spotify, Apple Music, download my new songs, uh, stream them, and uh, go to my new video, uh, Christmas Storm. And if you can, donate even a dollar. It helps. Uh, you know, everybody knows we've had one of the most, you know, brutal years. And this is uh, a way that we can help give some kids a great Christmas this year. So, well yeah. said. Well, thank you for practicing what you preach and just keep up the greatness there. Thank you, brother. Thanks. Take care. Yeah. Hi, Kristen. How's it going there today? I'm good. Is this Darren? This is Darren. This is Darren. And Hi. Thank you for doing this. Am I getting you from New York today? Honestly, I wish, as I'm a little homesick, but I am in the beautiful Vancouver shooting a new TV show starring Cecily Strong for Apple, and it is beautiful here, but I'm a little homesick. I can imagine. Usually when you're interviewing somebody, there's only one project to talk about. And of course, there's Holiday, <laughs> there's Candyland, there's The Witches, uh, there's some wonderful Kellogg's things going on. Tell me about what's behind you first and foremost. Yes, can we? So yeah. I don't know if you know this about me, Darren, but I don't cook. I like things that come in packages. You open them and then you eat it right? That's why this was such a great pairing for me because the Kellogg's family really knows what they're doing. I have been sent so much of their product 
people should go on www.kelloggsfamilyrewards.com to check out all the different kinds of cheese and platters that they have, cheese and cracker platters. But I'm just going to say, not that I should, but the flat flatbread cracker is my favorite, but I cannot confirm or deny that, Darren. Okay, you did not hear it here. I personally am a flatbread person when it comes to trying to eat healthy but indulgent at the same time. So great offerings behind you. And the movie Holiday, uh, my wife told me last night I had to watch it. We watched it. <laughs> then I realized, wait, you're in that. Uh, it was an absolute great coincidence and all that. What time of year did you film that? Because of course it shows all sorts of holidays. Okay, thank you for asking this, Darren. I would love to say we were in cozy, chilly Utah, shooting the Christmas movie, but we were in Hotlanta. Now, I love you, Atlanta, but it was hot, and it was July. It was June, and it was May, June, and July. So, you know, I was, I was hot, okay? I was hot, but I had a blast. It was so fun. I'm really glad that you're talking to me still. I think my family in Oklahoma was a little like, what did you do? But it was a fun movie uh, and part to play. And you're from a very cool, in my opinion, part of Oklahoma. You're part of, you're from a suburb of Tulsa. When did you start to notice that it was cool out there and not just that's where I grew up? Wow, thank you for saying that, really. Um, I remember when we arrived, I was in the second grade and I literally, Darren, saw a teepee and I thought, I want to go in that. I have since been to several powwows and come to understand a little bit more of my heritage. And I'm really glad that I grew up the way I grew up in that town. Um, we, we had a sense of community there that I don't know if, I don't know if it's internet or my age, but I feel like is lacking today. So there was a real sense of community and um, n almost a non-judgment place. It was a great, merging of city and country and you know I loved I loved growing up there when I was last in Tulsa I saw that they were actually paying artists and people to move out there and be creative did your roots as a performer go back to even then or did it more have to emerge once you left Oklahoma Oh, for sure it started there. The, when I was a little bitty girl, I auditioned for Tulsa Ballet Theater. They didn't take very many kids. I was lucky enough to be accepted. I did the church choir. Think about it. I was in the Bible Belt, so yeah. how was I going to sing and learn? Uh, my parents, we weren't moving to New York anytime soon, so I did ballet. I took piano lessons. I was in the church choir and the plays at school. I was pretty much a normal kid, but I I was, you know, singled out as, wait, what is that? You know, and I did feel kind of by myself in that way, but I had great teachers, which continued on to Oklahoma City University, where I met my mentor, Florence Birdwell, who um, I still have in my head today. And I can hear her going, you're not breathing deep. I can't understand you. And those are the kind of teachers that stay with you and help you have a long career. So let's let it stand for the record. You made Oklahoma cool before Hanson did. <laughs> Thank you. And Hanson, you know I love you. But hello, I was there first, babies. Yeah, you bridged the gap between Leon Russell and Hanson, which is a big accomplishment. That you said Leon Russell makes you way cooler than anybody I've talked to today, Darren. Leon Russell is the king. Let's just get it straight. And then there's Reba. Yeah. Oh, the list goes on and on. There's Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains. But, hey, that is not what we're talking about. We're, oh, you're pointing at your nose. Uh, that I means... love him. Okay. Come on now. Come on now. Come on now. Come on. <laughs> well, uh, going back to the many projects that you have going on there, does Kellogg's in any way factor into Candyland, or that's just it happens to be food-related and Kellogg's what's, and that's separate? What's the... Well, what's so funny, Darren, as I've said, I don't cook. Um, it's funny and ironic that I am the host of a show called Candyland for the nude, the, for the nude, the Food Network. Um, yeah. It, it was an interesting call to get because, I, again, I'm not comfortable in a kitchen. Um, the reality-based competition show is amazing. Watching other artists 
build things out of confection and sugar, I was amazed at what we did, what they did, what I got to see and witness. And then when Kellogg's phoned me, I was like, hello, I'm eating them now. So it's not a problem. Like I can talk about things I love mm -hmm. people. And everybody should definitely visit www.kelloggfamilyrewards.com to see their amazing like cheese and cracker and platters and all the different ideas they have for the holidays. I don't know about your family, but my family eats, okay? At holidays, we eat and we begin here. This family eats, this family drinks, and a, a, a testament to you is that you're juggling all these projects at the same time. At this point in your career, people know who you are, you're a household name, but how much of it is you having to audition and seek stuff out versus you stuff just coming to you and saying, I want to do this, I don't want to do this? It's interesting. I'm in a time in my life, and I've worked long and hard for many years. I'm in a time in my life where people either kind of know and they're, they're involved and they offer it or they, they're not interested. And that's a relief because to sort of have people know what, what you can bring and what you can offer. And, you know, I have many different lanes. I love to visit them all. I have worked with a lot of great directors. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm just grateful for the, all, all the different ways I get to work, Darren, because if I were just stuck in, you know, just, I love Broadway, that's my roots, but if it was just that, first of all, right now, I don't know how I'd make a living. I am beyond, beyond ready for Broadway to come back. And when we do, holy crap, people better watch out. Because I know there are people in the wings right now just waiting waiting, much like myself, waiting, waiting. I love film and TV, but the concert tour has been postponed. I was in the middle of it, just starting for the, girl, for the girls tour. And Broadway performers like me are, we're salivating. Of course, we wanna come back safe, right? Mm -hmm. But so for some of this, this is the way we live. And I'm just, I'm ready for it to, I'm ready for 2020 to be behind us. How's that? That works for me. Well, three quick questions and then you're free for me at least because <laughs> I know you have a lot of media to do today. Uh, the first thing is, is there anything you haven't done with your career yet you're, you're still hoping to work on or accomplish? Absolutely. I'm still that girl, right? I think the day that it's not there for me, I'll quit. Um, I want to produce a Broadway show. Hmm whether it be mine or one that I envision or one that I want to make a star. One of those three. I would like to produce a Broadway show. I have not been successful at that. I want that more than anything. Okay, question two. Candyland aside, what's a show that people should be watching in your opinion? Oh, oh, so many people are gonna be mad at me. Oh. Um, obviously scripted shows are really important as I'm an actress, but I love anything on Bravo and <laughs> I love below deck and scene. Okay. You got taste in the closer. Kristen, any last words for the kids? Yeah. For all kids out there, I'm speaking to you as a former kid and a kid at heart. This too shall pass. And when it does, we will be ready. Thank you, and thank you to Team Kellogg's for making this happen, and just keep up the greatness there. Thank you, Darren. Be safe. You Stay too. safe. Take care. Hey, Fran, how's it going there? Good, thanks. To put it mildly, I had a bit of a, a thing earlier where I said, I've been a fan of Travis for over 20 years now. <laughs> it it kind of hit me of like... How old you were? Yeah, how old I am and how that almost makes you like a classic rock band at this point. Has that uh, ever hit you, that realization? You know, I was thinking about it and I think I think the Rolling Stones have changed the definition of classic rock bands for all of us. I think all of the older bands have, and that goes for maybe, um, you know, Ozzy Osbourne and all these older guys. And I think now, you know, you've really got... I think the idea of classic rock has completely changed. I think classic rock is 
a genre. And I don't know if we're part of classic rock. I think we're something else. I think classic rock's um, 70s, you know, 70s rock. That's sure. kind of what, to me, that's what classic rock's... Um, to me. So I don't know if... But we're, we're definitely elder indie statesmen. <laughs> in the best you know. of ways i have to say <laughs> yeah yeah because uh going back to that legacy kind of thing <laughs> i think it was the bonus disc a couple albums ago which had the 1999 glaxonberry show and you're talking about songs from the man who's like ah, oh, well this is a new song of ours and at yeah. this point in time you've had so many singles that i'm sure if you played 16 songs live people would be like ah oh, they missed these three hits and these three favorites of mine. So I have to imagine it's tough at this point in time when touring resumes to put together a set list. Yeah, it is a little bit tricky. You know, I, I'm, I'm really, really hard on myself as a, a writer. Um, I was watching, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but this uh, Bee Gees documentary. Sure. Just come out. It's fucking brilliant. Pardon my French. <laughs> and, it, you know, I always loved the Bee Gees and I never understood the... <clears throat> they went through a phase of <clears throat> overexposure. I can understand the overexposure because we definitely, in The Man Who, got overexposed. A few songs, especially like Why Does It Always Rain On Me, just maybe got played a little bit too many times. And to me, that it. was a good thing. To you, yeah, well, it was over exposure and good uh, payments through your PRO funds. For me, yeah, yeah. it was, um, hey, a lot of people are finding out of this band, and when they're touring with Dido, people are singing along. Yeah, 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 that's <laughs> true, that's true. Um, so, uh, but watching the, 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 the Bee Gees thing, I, I, it, got me, it got me feeling a little bit sad. I was like, fuck, man. You know, we, we, we've, um, we never got, we never got, the, 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 our, if, if you've seen the documentary, did you watch I, it? I know about what happens in it, and I'm a big Bee Gees fan, but I haven't seen the whole thing. So the, the interesting thing with them is um, is this idea of um, their two careers in the Bee Gees' lifetime. Yeah. They have their 60s career, um, and then they, they go into this... Stigwood. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're playing these shitholes in Britain. And then Eric Clapton suggests, you know, guys, you should go and record an album over in Miami and just get get into the sunshine and blah, blah, blah. And this is where they start changing all their, and they accidentally come across this, ha, ha, you know, this, this yeah. sound. And it, it just made me kind of think, oh, shit, man, I, I really, um, my songs are shit. <laughs> oh. No, it's funny, but, but this is the thing. You know, I was talking to a friend the other day. Um, he's a comedian called Dimitri Martin. Oh yeah, um, great comic. Dimitri's an, an old, old friend of mine, and we were just we were sort of bemoaning the, the pandemic and that we couldn't tour. He can't tour either. And um, we were talking about um, artists and how we we all kind of it, it, we all have imposter syndrome. All of us. He has it. I have it. Um, and he even said he had he he's like oh I just wrote a joke about uh, someone with imposter syndrome with imposter syndrome <laughs> and then um, typical Dimitri and yeah. um, but this is it you know you you don't really I think at the at the heart of of every um, artist there's a there's a a little tiny seed of um, you you know you're good. But it's surrounded by a cloud of doubt, and this is, you know, so it's it's that we're still here. I'm like, oh, this is great. But I think the thing that drives you to try and write songs is maybe this idea that shit, I'm not good enough, or I could maybe because they're all out there, they're, they're all still floating around. All yeah. these songs are kind of so, you know. I, um, I I understand where you're going with that. Before I ask you about ten songs, though, there was a song couple albums ago called Selfish Gene, which I was curious about after you wrote that um, two-parter, was there more of a push to get you to do more almost dancey songs like that? Or did that song even just start out as like a typical laid back, but edgy Travis song and then got pushed up to that? Well, you know, tempo wise. Yeah, because it's, um, 
I use the word dancey. Like sometimes every now and then you get a, a Travis song that is bouncier in, yeah. in a way. Um, yeah. And it, yeah. I say all that as a big fan of Travis, of course. Well, yeah, yeah. Th- that song, hold on. I'm just going to get, just stay there. Okay. Sure, man. Because it's here. Um, that song. So I'm going to put you up here. Whoa, do this. that's a guitar. That's a guitar. <laughs> so uh, I'll turn you the right way around. Right, so this, this here. C chord, yeah. That's, that, I use that in a, in a couple of songs. Like um, I use it in All I Want to Do is Rock. Hey, hey, yeah. I use it in What's so wrong with the feast <laughs> Is it over? Yeah. And then I used it in Selfish Gene, which goes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's Selfish Gene is like a sped up version of Love. <laughs> when I just I realized when I played it there for you. But the thing is, um, wait, where are you? I've got to turn it back around. <laughs> Technology. I think that, um, you know, I know for a fact that that song was always an up tempo song. I was uh, I wrote it in um, I wrote it in in our house in London. Um, I had this little space under the stairs, and uh, and again I was playing about with with these these this C shape with the finger coming on and off. Yeah, and I just I did it kind of up tempo like that, and it felt good. And that's the thing about like tempos like. Um, when we wrote "Why Does It Wet," when we were piecing together "Why Does It Always Rain on Me" in the studio, um, it was much faster. It felt like um, the tempo was like tied to the '90s, which is a song that we we have on our first album. Right. A little bit more like did, 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 did. great up tempo felt, song from the first record, sure. Yeah, and it just felt a little bit. It didn't feel right in that tempo. This up tempo. So I was like, let's just play it like we're playing it in slow motion so we just knocked the tempo down really a lot and then it, it, suddenly it was like oh this is really amazing it sounded totally different and so you know it's same way with um if you played selfish gene in a slower tempo even a couple of clicks slower it would not it wouldn't feel the same Right. So you, you you just you get it into the sweet spot, and it almost the song tells you, right, this is perfect because you, you can say the words in the right time. You're not rushing or you're not slurring. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the, 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 yeah, good question though. Well, I you know sometimes you want your your interviewers to know the catalog, and other times you want to them to go like, oh, tell me about the new record. So <laughs> I'll transition that to the new record. When you have an album called Ten Songs. Was that like a working title or did it actually, oh, I'm already getting a no. So you knew outright it was called 10 songs. Yeah. We, we um, you know, I had a, I was looking at my, on my, I, my, my iPad last night. Um, at all of when I was in the studio, I was going through titles. We had in, in February and March this year, we were doing our second session and finishing off the recording and mixing. And then while I was in the studio, I was thinking about the titles, like, what am I going to call this? <clears throat> One of them was, um, what was it again? Um, can I just check? Let me just yeah, check. Yeah, sure, man. We're live. Hold on. <laughs> no. I'm just going to, you, 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 you'll not see me for a second because I'm just going on to Procreate, which is my, my thing of choice. Sure. Thank God, you want to see how much how many drawings and things are on this for this record it's insane right hey creative guy doing creative things <laughs> um let's see uh, where is it there we go ctrl plus w okay that was one of the that was one of the the the, the names of the of one leaf one one life left was another uh-huh one life left was another working title for this album um and there was lots of different artwork as well. Hold on, let me come back to you. I can't get, I can't get out of this. Help. Well, where, um, where I was so going yeah. with with that is, 
uh, knowing what I know for music business work, a lot of people who have a publishing deal, their thing is, well, you have to turn in 10 songs or else you don't get the advance. I didn't know because you've always had a great sense of humor and it's always <laughs> yeah, come yeah. across in concert. I didn't know if that was a, well, 10 oh, songs no, 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 advance. No, 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 no. It was really, it was really like I was going through these different titles. Like one life left was in CTRLW, which is like closing a window. You know, yeah. this idea of, because it felt to me, this this album feels like the, the end of uh, many things and the beginning of uh, new things. And um, I, but it just all felt a little bit arch and I just felt like, and then I, I had the track listing always looking at the names of the songs and um, we kept calling it, not kept calling it 10 songs, but referring to it as 10 songs um when we were talking about on oh, this you know this one out of the 10 songs and mm-hmm. it sounded cool you know and we have another <laughs> album called 12 memories yes so it chimed it chimed in a little bit with those kind of titles or that that title and um when i think the most important thing about this title is i don't think people are you know there, there are people writing songs still um but not many of us and um when I say a song, I mean something that's that, that goes a little bit beyond a, a jingle. Right. It goes a little bit beyond uh, just entertainment. There's something a little bit deeper there that speaks to you um, yeah. about your life or the truth or whatever. And so I think to write a song in this time and when there's not much going on song-wise is kind of cool. You know, it's kind of um, punk <laughs> <laughs> to, to, for That's want fair. of a better term, um, who'd have thought that writing a simple song could be punk? But it, it sort of is nowadays because no one's doing it, and no one's doing it because it's fucking hard. <laughs> it is. I'm, 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 you know, listen. I listen. To, I listen to music a lot, and th- there's, there's, there's not many brilliant melodies at the moment that inspire me. I have to sit and try and think of think think right. of my own and um but yeah anyway yeah yeah this is one of those years where it'd be really hard to do a top 10 list because you have to kind of think of are there 10 albums that i really liked and listened to all the way through now if i were doing that or a top five obviously your album goes on there so take the damn compliment but something i'm curious about is a lot of bands kind of have their their peaks and their valleys where they go i don't know we kind of Maybe we should break up. Maybe we should change directions. But when you listen to the Travis albums, it doesn't seem like you guys ever got bad. You ever started using outside co-writers. You ever had to go, well, here's our EDM track. You didn't do that. It, it, was there a period, though, where it was like, is this the end of Travis? Yeah, definitely. We, we had a bit of a period like that. Um, when was it? I think it wasn't a feeling... It got to that feeling. It started out like we all just had a break, like we all went off to be dads. And this was between Ode to Jay Smith and um, um, Where You Stand. Mm-hmm. And um, in that time, I did. I had I had written a, a record, almost like it was going to be a Travis record. But we all went on a break, so I did my solo thing, which was okay. It's really nice, good songs, and yeah. um, a, a nice experience. But you know, I'm in a band, so. Um, but there was a point, you know, towards uh, like year three of being out of the band and not touring and not doing anything that it felt, oh God, is this it? You know, are we are we done? Are we are we actually going to go back and do this? And um, and we did. And it was it was a kind of we got a call to do a show. That was the reason we got back together. Uh, there was a show somewhere, and um, we met, and every, everyone was great it was as if we'd seen each other two days earlier and um and it was fine it's always difficult being in any kind of close quarters with you know other other (laughs) people of course and um but we've really weathered the storms really well we've respected each other's kind of need to just chill and, and not see anyone else you know in the band and um, which is really important. We've also we're also Scottish, so we, we we're kind of sensible. We have our feet on the ground. And we always kept our feet on the ground, so um, we know what's important. We have a good sense of priorities, and um, 
I think, you know, to be in a band is one of the most amazing um, um, jobs you can you can have. Um, there's definitely a lot of waiting around. But, um, <laughs> like but, acting, yeah. But the, 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 to, to, to do that job is, is like a complete, it's a trip, you know. No one, no one gets to do that. So I, we, we're all pretty, um, um, we're not, it's not lost on us, you know. So we, we've, we've kept it, we've looked after it, and that's why we're still together. There's that gratitude. Well, you got time for three quick questions and then you're a free man? <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. The first question, if you are a big sports fan here in New York, you hear a lot about Fran Healy, but that's not the singer Fran Healy from Travis. Do any photos of you and that Fran Healy exist? See that? I missed, I missed, I missed, that. I do, missed that last part. Do Sorry. any photos of you and that other Fran Healy exist? Have you ever met? Oh, <laughs> there's the baseball card. Right. There's a picture of me in the front. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've been asked that all the time, but, uh, you know, growing up, you'd hear, and now going to Fran Healy, and you're like, what? He's on TV in New York? Okay. There you go. Uh, you know, it's funny because I, like, um, it's really weird because he is, like, a big fucking deal in, in baseball. Um, and he's quite a, he's quite a, um, polarizing figure sure it seems and so when when you know when myspace was starting and, and before we had before facebook and before twitter and all that we had myspace and i would get these <laughs> disgruntled um, <laughs> i would get these people like these uh, crazy baseball people going you motherfucker <laughs> and i'm like who the hell is this brand new but the weird thing is, like, we lived in New York for a little while. We right. had an apartment there for 12 years, 14 years, actually. And um, I think he lived really nearby because I looked us up. I looked him up in, in the telephone directory. He was there. He's, like, two blocks from me. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't get any of his hate mail to your physical address in Soho. Yeah, that would have been uncomfortable there you go and the closer fran uh, any last words for the kids i am uh, i would say you know it's been a fucking can i swear yeah you can most people can it's been a fucking hard year for everyone i've known people who've lost their mums and dads to this thing this um um pandemic and um and there's not you know but, uh, until that sort of happened, I was quite, eh, and I still am a little bit because, you know, you just have to, it's a British thing, you know, you, you, you just have to laugh, you just have to smile through it. Um, but I think we're coming, I, th I think we all begin to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I'm very, um, I'm not an anti-vaxxer person, but I'm very anti-corporate America person, and I find a lot of, you know, the big pharmaceutical people to be suspect not the science just the people who run those businesses sure but i'm very very hopeful about the the um the pfizer you know the the um the um, mrna yeah. vaccine this is like it's like futuristic science that they're doing this it's not like the, the the old way they used to do it um they're doing new things and i think not only is it exciting for covid like for instance, my doctor um, in in Los Angeles, he he's had it. He got to the two in August and September, and he's fine. He's doing he's fine. Um, he has sore arm when he got it done, but like that's to be expected. He, uh, but to me, right now, I think it's pretty exciting. Not just for COVID, but for all these kind of viruses that are flying around now. Um. They have this new technology which is going to make it, um, which is going to help us fight all these things and old things as well. So I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. I really want to get back on the road. All of us, all of the bands, um, every yeah. band. I mean, you've got like I was talking to someone the other day about the Strokes, and they they brought their album out right on the right on the pandemic, and they yeah they we. All the bands I know, we've all had to cancel everything, uh, reschedule, and or just take you know that away. And it's it's a big part of a record. So I really hope. And the mad thing is, we haven't toured in America for years, and we were planning on coming, 
and then this happened. So, yeah. But but I'm looking forward to coming back. A long answer to a short question. But, <laughs> you know, it's been a long year. A great answer to a question that's been asked a lot. So I really appreciate your time. And when things get normal, You're looking welcome. forward to seeing you live in New York again. And just keep um, up the great music. It's really, it's great to see that somebody could still be great 20-ish years after they make an impact. <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm going to try. <laughs> Thanks, friend. Have a great rest of the day. You too. See you later. Take care. Outrocast. Thanks for checking out the Paltrocast with Darren Paltrow. It's produced by V13 Media. Theme song by Steve Schiltz. Audio mixing by Mark Pirro. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Outrocast.